And we're live. Welcome to Music Matters with Jason Tram. Thank you so much for joining us for our unique podcast community where we explore the triumphs and challenges of the performing arts world as seen through the eyes of distinguished colleagues. Thank you so much for helping us grow. We just hit 1,750 subscribers thanks to you. Please like and share our videos and smash that bell icon for the most up-to-date information on our upcoming uh, guests on the podcast. Also, make sure you subscribe. You can find us on all of the various social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. And uh, we're so delighted that you're here. We have a fantastic guest today returning. We have Maestro Nir Cabaretti, who is the music and artistic director of the Santa Barbara Symphony, as well as music director of the Israel Sinfonietta Beersheba. And he's also a guest conductor all around the world. And we're delighted to have him back. Welcome, Nir. Thank you, Jason, for having me. Lovely to be back. We had a snowy day in New York. How, how's the weather on the left coast today? Oh, sorry to tell you, it's uh, rather sunny today. It was a few gray days, but today's actually beautiful. Great to hear. And I, I imagine it's 72 and sunny, right? <laughs> Just short of that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I love California. So what, what it was like, you know, we, last time we talked about well, almost a year ago, we were in the middle of the shutdown and you were doing incredible work with the uh, with uh, the, the streaming performances and recording the orchestra live. What's it been like regaining the stage? Right, yes. When we talked, it was everything was shut down and we found ways, ways to uh, deliver our mission, you know, uh, to enrich the community. Um, instead of uh, live performances, we did uh, some uh, recorded performances. Uh, but it was sometime around spring, um, we started to uh, go back to a live audience and then started traveling. So I think since then I did uh, five uh, overseas um, travels. Just got back two weeks ago uh, from long time in Israel and Italy. And so, you know, it started to come back to normality, but now with the surge coming back, uh, we did uh, cancel last weekend's performances here in Santa Barbara. I mean, not canceled, I should rather say we postponed them. And um, we, 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 we had to act very quickly. Uh, things were escalating fast. And, uh, you know, there are so many factors that you put together when such a decision comes. And uh, uh, we decided it's for the sake of safety uh, and also to honor the audience who did not feel comfortable to come to a theater packed with people that we postponed it to, um, to the spring, to May. Um, this in particular was a program that um, we saw were looking forward to it, um, music by Arturo Marquez. You know, Arturo mm -hmm. Marquez, uh, one of maybe the most performed uh, composer in today's time. And that thanks to uh, Maestro Gustavo Dudamel who, you know, with the Simon Bolivar Orchestra toured the world basically with uh, the music of Arturo Marquez and especially the Danson number no. two. Now Arturo Marquez uh, wrote uh, a beautiful violin concerto, very similar to the Danson's in the sense of using uh, Mexican uh, traditional uh, rhythms. If you want it, there is a mariachi touch to it. Oh, exciting. Yeah, and um, it was commissioned by the LA Field and Anna Kiko Myers, a fantastic violinist. And uh, we were in the performance uh, in the board premiere, met Arturo Marquez, had a nice talk with Maestro Dudamel. And we were supposed to be the second orchestra that plays this piece. And that was last weekend. And uh, Arturo Marquez actually um, booked an airfare to come to the performance and to be in the rehearsal. So when he uh, sent us an invitation, but uh, 10 days before the concert that he doesn't feel comfortable to go. And, and of course, you know, we had a few musicians tested positive right before the concert, uh, before the rehearsals or had some issues. You know, it's enough if uh, you have some, you live with somebody elderly or your wife is pregnant or whatever reason that you want to be more careful. And uh, we realize it's probably a safer uh, to do it uh, later on, and also to have the community enjoy that. Um, I have to say there were some people that were extremely uh, excited to go back and play, as well as audience. Some were upset that we canceled or we postponed. 
some were very grateful. So it's split, you know, between the musicians, between the community. Um, but I think we did the right decision to um, to to enable everyone to enjoy it uh, in a later uh, time. And we're working with the orchestra committee, with the union, to make sure that whatever we did, the decision um, is is well uh, taken. These challenges, that, were, every organization's facing these challenges. I don't think these are going to go away in the short term. It seems like these are things we're going to have to live with moving forward. And uh, it's a challenge for the music director, it's a challenge for the board and all the players. But uh, we always have to do what's best for our community in the end, right? Correct. And uh, yes, there are, I, I guess we, we are living in a wave kind of uh, <laughs> periods, which is, you know, for us musicians, we look at forms all the time. You know, when I look at the first movement of the symphony, I know so not allegro. Exactly. You know where it comes, where the repetition comes, where the recapitulation comes. And I guess, you know, this is a situation that we faced a few months ago, and hopefully within a few weeks it will clear up. And um, let's hope it, the next wave will not be too soon. But in the middle... The, we, that's the end. Hopefully that's the, the wave of... The, there's a couple of schools of right. thought. That, yeah, that, right. We'll leave the, of... That's for the you know, medical uh, authorities to to guide us. I think the, the fact that there was not a lot of guidance did hurt because some organizations canceled, some did not. Um, you know, everybody has his own kind of decision process. Um, for us, I thought it worked uh, the way it should be. And but, you know, just regardless, we we a lot of things change. You know, it's funny because um, I have done my first musical ever in October, and that was a, a huge project. Uh, initiated here by uh, a local um, donor who wanted to see that happening. And uh, we rehearsed, we started to rehearse in New York City. And that was the first time we sort of put on a, on a weekly uh, testing program. And it was very cool. It was, you know, all the Broadway uh, theaters turned into to be into uh, testing sites, massive testing site. And you just come and, and scan your phone and whatever production you were related to it immediately came up and was rapid and, and um, a, a pcr one and then when we came back to santa barbara and uh you know rehearsed with the chorus with the orchestra then uh the union the equity union was saying well the numbers are climbing up we should maybe do twice a week and by the performances we had four performances by the performances week um that was even doubled. So we were almost uh, every day. And for this now, the time that we are um, here, at least in our uh, area, we are basically asking a rapid test before each rehearsal. Um, I think that's the safest way it is, is to have those rapid tests. And I did that on a recording in New York City. The first week of January was so much COVID going around. I, was, I told you on the pre-show, I booked a 40-piece orchestra for a recording, and 10 people got sick within three days before the show. And it was like a revolving door in the, in the wind section for some reason. Exactly. And I guess in New York, if somebody, you know, got a COVID issue, you could replace him within seconds, uh, you know. Uh, Thankfully Santa for Barbara. Tchaikovsky, yes. <laughs> right. In, in Santa Barbara, and, and that was also part of our decision um, making is like, you know, if something happened, if this positive <laughs> percentage wise is so high just before the dress rehearsal we are two and a half hours away from the next musician uh that could come it is it's probably won't make it in time and uh, so uh yeah that's i i can totally see the stress for all personal managers now that you know people have in the were exposed or just rather got it to replace a musician it's not so easy there are revolving shows on Broadway that are closing because it's not that they for the audience, it's for that the, that the covers are getting sick. And, if they, and then the leads got sick, and then the covers were getting sick, and they actually couldn't put the cast together. There were a couple of shows that were closed for a week or two weeks, and this, it's that's why the testing is so good on Broadway. But it's it's scary when you're a producer to have to kind of Ab weigh in these absolutely, challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. But you know, again, let's hope uh, let's hope it's uh, will be over in, in a few weeks and things will calm down. You know, also traveling, it's interesting, you know, if before it's just you, you know, do you check in from the application of on the, your iPhone? Now it's so much more complicated. You have to fill documents and you have to show, and it's so confusing. It started with, you have to show a PCR 72 hours before 
uh, departure. Then it become like 48 hours before landing. Now it's 24 hours before departure. And I'm always like nervous. Did I get it right? Did I do the right <laughs> test? And, uh, and now also it's not so easy to book a test, you know. So I was, um, you know, we, we were in Italy. We're about to come back. And um, it, it was really stressful to, to find a way that could do a rapid test in time for the flight, we stayed in line. I was four and a half hours, you know, out in a rainy morning in Florence, Italy to, to make it. Uh, but um, yeah, it happened. That's one thing about musicians. Musicians are versatile and they will make things happen, right? Right. You will never lose a gig because you need to file another document, entry document, you know. It's, it's uh, also funny. Some of, uh, you know, I used to fly mainly uh, nonstop if it's possible. I try to avoid connection. That's, you know, kind of increased the... Uh, possibilities to lose something on your way anything can happen right <laughs> anything can happen but you know because flight schedules were reduced so i did to ha i did have few connections strange connections like in europe and so okay if i fly to israel i need to do the, the entry uh document in israel but i also need to file the trans you know, transition form in germany which require different tests <laughs> all of that but as you said artists musicians nothing will stop us <laughs> from getting on stage and that's the way it is for all the organizations and we make things happen, you know, regardless, even even when we couldn't perform, we were still performing and working and planning. And I think that's the uh, I think that's the takeaway is that no matter what, the arts always find a way to come through and to right. produce our mission and to make music and art come alive. Right. And it was very inspiring to see some of the work of uh, other colleagues, other orchestras, uh, what they came to. But I also think that, um, you know, um, regardless to the pandemic so many things happened in the world uh, during that time that um, made us think in a different way and uh, and be more versatile i want to say um, diversity became su such more important part of uh, what we do um i guess in the us probably more than anywhere else um i guess because the diversity is um so much more present here uh you know i, I think u.s um as a country of immigrants it just has the, the the best kind of base for so many diverse cultures uh, and different ethnicities so i think um I, I could see that in in articles and talking to colleagues like how important that to make finally uh, that we all are on the same page, that, you know, we honor, we preserve the, the great classics and, and um, the great composer from the past. That's part of our duty to, to make sure this music that was written so long ago will not disappear. Will um, and, and by doing that, we need to play it because there are certain techniques that if we don't uh, pay attention, they will just disappear. <laughs> But at the same time, make sure that we honor, you know, composer that were maybe forgotten or a composer that did not get attention that they should have. Uh, and that's, of course, a selection of the um, guest artists. So, so many things happened. And, and I think we are coming out of it uh, at least uh, much more com complete, I think, in our artistic vision. I think we've all had so much time to think, right? With all the travel canceled and <laughs> all the live rehearsals canceled and everything condensed, we've all had so much time to, I say everyone's become a philosopher during COVID. So we all had that time to kind of re rethink about what could be and then put it in practice when we came back. I agree, being uh, more at home, uh, away from stage and, and just to look uh, deeper to some things. And I listened to a few pieces that I never heard before you know and um just n not because i did not it just did not happen you know I, as a student in, in in vienna almost every week you could come to one concert you will hear a Brahms symphony or a beethoven symphony so you know within your time as a student you've heard all beethoven all Brahms, all schumann uh, probably all bruckner i don't know schubert uh but there are certain pieces that i never had a chance actually to listen to even and um you know that's even the time said, well, I wonder how this Shostakovich chamber <laughs> symphony sounds like. And um, yeah, I think for all of us, it was uh, a good moment to stop and study uh, some things that we didn't have time before. What's something you learned about yourself during that period? Um, that I can be more flexible than I thought I could. <laughs> 
you know, uh, we we do plan long ahead, and that's something that we do um, from very very early age. Um, you know, we um, we are trained to to learn something for a certain date, and and we sort of program our time. And so there are long term projection uh, projects that you sort of prepare ahead of time, but all of a sudden you need to change. And that's not something I used to do a lot. It's, um, you know, to study pieces quickly, to adjust. Okay, we cannot have a big orchestra, but we have a date. We need to change that. So, and and again, to, to I mean, I know it sounds a little bit like a cliche, but to, to think a little bit out of what we're used to, to think a little bit out of the box, the comfortable, our comfortable uh, zone, um, we had to add some something. more improvisation to our to our mix, <laughs> throwing right. us some, some chord changes that we didn't expect. <laughs> right. And, and that's something, you know, that we have in our industry, like a section for musicians who can improvise. And and, and I was never at that category because, you know, that's we Me either. think of, of improvising um, in musicians that basically compose uh, uh, online live. And but I thought. Uh, we all had to learn to improvise and make sure that we we had a plan B and adjust to that uh, quickly. That's not something that I think most of the colleagues had to deal with. Now we've um, so of all your concerts canceled, how many did you? If you had to guess, how many concerts did you have canceled? And I know for a music director like yourself who plans multiple seasons for multiple organizations and guest conducts. I mean, I know the planning process goes out multiple years. I mean, it, it really, it's a lot of work. People don't realize the, the amount of time that goes into planning a season. How many performances do you yeah, say well, were canceled? Well, um, there was, uh, let's say, between March of 2020 to the, um, to the March of 2021, that was a year that a lot of concerts were canceled. The thing is, some of the projects were moved. So this year is was pretty packed. I had... Over the last uh, two months, uh, I think 16 performances in different places. But some of that was, you know, the rebound from last year. And um, moving forward, so the little next two years are kind of thick with performances. Some of them were are rescheduled. But um, as I said, there was, you know, maybe eight, nine months of no concert. But we, as I said, we did provide some streaming, so we changed that. We couldn't honor the original program because it was a huge orchestra. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, also the fact that we are adjusting the um, stage conditions to be safe, that also changed the program because all of a sudden you cannot feature a huge brass section because, you know, they need to be separated and we have, uh, you know, plexiglasses and things like that. You know, I was now in Rome and um, with the opera house, the pit normally has many more musicians, but now that they were socially distanced. Oh, uh, interesting. Even in know, the pit, that's a challenge pit. with pits. Yeah, exactly. And 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 the plexiglasses. All of a sudden, I had the percussion in the boxes, you know, <laughs> which was you know quite challenging. More improvising, up. right? That the opera house is trying to figure out how to make it work. Right. So for the play. musicians, for the musicians as well, you know, it is a stress. You said, oh, I, I never played in this position. I want to hear my colleague, you know, the timpani is, you know, a few feet away and, uh, and not on the same level. So, yes, that's that's also part of, but we learned that that it is doable. It might not be the most, um, not the easiest and the most comfortable, but once you rehearse and you start to work, you, you find a way. And I think that's part of how musicians are sensitive to, to, to changes and um, you know I, I I and also you know like wearing a mask all the time that you know, when the ears are like that it's funny in one of their sessions um, principal flute in the opera in Rome uh, wonderful musician and, and really nice man and said to me maestro you should not have this thing you you could have a clip here and attach the pla-. so I actually bought this one thing for one dollar and to avoid the the ear brought. <laughs> It was quite, you know, when you're there for 12 hours a day between orchestra reading and stage orchestra, you know, by the end of the day, my, my ears were like just irritating. And, and so I found this way, luckily, so now I'm, you know, kind of wearing the mask a little bit. It's, it's, it worked well. So <laughs> all kind of, of uh, things. But, you know, musically wise, um, 
things are moving forward. We are not waiting. We're not um, stopping anything. You know. How lot... emotional was your first rehearsal back and your first performance back? And what was it? It, it was it was beautiful to hear you know the applause to hear live people people are there you know uh as perfect as a recording could be it you could feel that there's something missing an energy that i don't even know how to describe it but uh back in uh, end of april when we um when i had the first time with audience after more than a year a year and two months uh that was beautiful and uh i think just being grateful and thankful for the opportunity to be part of such a dream uh, profession. And uh, I think for all of us, musicians, audience alike, we, it was a magic moment. And, uh, and, and now that we had to postpone last week and we, we again, it's almost came to routine. Yes, we are back, everything. And now we understand it is fragile still. And uh, every opportunity to go back on stage, uh, we should uh, treasure and cherish um yeah but, but meanwhile you, you were talking about you know programs and 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 thing that we, we are thinking about you know years now to come with projects i do try to be a little bit more maybe um i would say a little bit more careful with the size of the orchestra it's not only budget as you know we know we, when we budget a, a piece that has 100 piece orchestra. Uh, Mahler is always costly. <laughs> yes, Mahler. And um, so we try to be careful for that because who knows if in two years something will come up. And um, so it's not only a, a financial issue, but uh, also kind of to be careful that. Uh, so I think for the next few years, we, we would like to avoid huge orchestras. And uh, there are some pieces, you know, that um, Strauss, Mahler, Bruckner, that, you know, we said maybe that's not the right time and um Mahler yeah, so will have it, to go on next season right right yes <laughs> yes but but you know what what we're trying to do and and also the fact that um being more kind of local i think also part of the thinking is um and i see that both in israel with my orchestra and here is how can we um leverage enough how can we work and collaborate better with local forces and that means local art organizations and um, local artists. When I'm saying local, they don't have to live here, but that they have some kind of, co you know, contact, rather studied, performed, uh, you know, born here or, or said in Israel. I think that's also part of what COVID told us to to rely on your local um, talents. And uh, and I think also that's kind. Of, if you ask me, that's also part of the mission of uh, regional orchestra. Um, you know, um, it, it's great to have the most known artists as part of your season, but it's also important to to honor uh, local forces, local talents that uh, you should all be proud of that because their musical journey is connected to to our musical journey in in, in the community, and and I think. Um, that's there, there's part. pride in that local. The, yeah, I think there's a lot of pride in that. I think it's really a healthy thing to do is to to find that balance between the international solo exactly. circuit and also the local professionals who might live there. And by the way, the local could be international, and they are very often are. Uh, it's just uh, that you know sometimes you know you don't have your own profit. In, but I was um, just going to say I love that quote. You know, it's hard to become a profit in your own land. <laughs> exactly, and uh, and however, you know, you're right. The balance between things that are great somewhere else you want to have your community explore together but it's also important to maintain um, um as say i was let's say local patriotism or you know this pride um for many reasons and um it has a certain uh it is attractive to the community to know this is ours and um you know so for example our next concert here in uh, santa barbara in few weeks uh, is about nature and music and uh, one of the pieces that will be performed uh, we are collaborating with the botanic garden here in town oh. and uh, of course music and nature has a lot to do but uh, we will play a piece by Jeff Beale, um, composer Jeff Beale, known for House of Cards, he was a fabulous uh, composer and uh, wonderful uh, human being, also a trumpet player which I recently discovered 
and uh, he's supposed to come if COVID permits. Um, and his piece, the, the Great Cycle, um, is inspired by um, some of the disaster, nature disaster that we had here in our community, 23 people. And, um, and, and to see the devastating uh, images, of course, impacted everyone in town, but now to reflect on that in a musical way and uh, the piece will be also accompanied with images. Um, so it will be sort of um, um, visual multimedia um, experience to hear the music of Jeff Bill and see images. Very of exciting. And, and part of it is also from our botanic garden uh, and seeing uh, not only disaster, but also the hope of rebirth. That's the last movement of his five movement cycle and uh, how nature grows back. And, and that's the hope. And of course, you know, talking about nature, it gives me an, a great excuse. I did not need an excuse to play Pastoral Symphony by Beethoven, but that's a, <laughs> that's a great uh, um, a great cause to to add that. And you know, as we, not everything should be related. I you know, I like to put uh, titles for uh, programs, but um, the piece that the third piece in the program is a. Uh, harp concerto by Jennifer Higdon and Ooh. I mean you know when you hear a harp and uh, you, you can relate to nature of course but it has no nat uh, nature title however a beautiful piece and um, you know talking about uh, featuring local forces um, um, I was happy to um, extend the invitation to our principal harp player Michelle Temple to, to play that it's also part of my mission uh, I think it's important that the audience, the community, knows the caliber of your musicians. Uh, I think every orchestra, and, and some do, some not, but like feature your own musicians as soloists. Some of them are incredible. And, um, and you know, uh, Jennifer Higdon, one of the most prominent U.S. composer. You know, very often I hear a female composer, well, She's a great composer, a star. Let's say, yes, she's a female, by the way. But <laughs> I was delighted to get to work with her when she came. She lives in Philadelphia. I don't know if she still does, but right. she did when I, when I was a doctoral student. And we played right. the uh, Rutgers premiered a piece by her, and I was involved in that. It was so beautiful to meet her and to work with her. And she's really just kept on writing great music for so long and has established herself as one of the greats in America, certainly. Exactly. I, I think she's still in Philadelphia. Uh, she did retire from... Uh, She's far too young to retire, but from uh, teaching uh, at Curtis uh, Institute, yes. But you're right, uh, beautiful music. I've, I've played a few of her um, pieces. Uh, it's lovely. Musicians love playing it. It sits well on the orchestra, which is also nice. You know, it's you come to rehearsal and it sits. It's, um, I don't know how to describe it. Some, in some cases, you have to work so hard to get it actually that, to start to hear something. And, and um, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's exciting to bring new things to life, and um, it's such a great pairing. You put the Higdon with the uh, the Beale, and uh, the the, the exactly. multimedia. Certainly, we have such a visual society. People just love the multimedia aspect, adding that to great music and the the power that that, that synthesis provides. I, I do be, um, think like that, but uh, you know, well, some some people will say, well, you know, I, I like to listen, I like to close my eyes, you know, I'm. Uh, but but this this particular piece by Jeff Beale was conceived that way. You know, it's unlike I would, you know, put, which we did in the past. We did picture at exhibition and we had a phenomenal film done by really fantastic young animators, mm -hmm. animation film. That's something, a project that uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, Maestro Tilson Thomas, um, opened uh, the new hall uh, in Miami for the New World Symphony. And when we did this project, you know, so we basically took, you know, the, the iconic Mussorgsky with the, um, orchestration of Ravel and add the film to that. You know, I thought it was great because, you know, I've heard hundreds of uh, pictures and I've done myself a few of them and so, and without the film. And doing it with the film was a cool experience. You know, some people say, well, I was distracted. I, you know, I wait for the gates of here and I listen to the bells and all of a sudden I see something. It's kind of freaked me out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have those reactions as well, and, and I totally uh, accept that, you know, it's not for everyone. But in this particular case, the music, and especially from somebody like Jeff Bill, who comes from the media, writing music for TV and, and film, it, it's really coming together. So, yeah.
And well, certainly, uh, you think about the great composers of the past. What would you know? The, so many of the great composers who lived during the film age were writing for film. I wonder would Beethoven write for a film? Would Mozart write for a film if it existed when they were alive? That's a good question. I think though, I, I would. My question, my answer would be yes, they would because they were most of them were really on the avant-garde side. Which would have been uh, they, opera, certainly, right? <laughs> that would right, have been their film. There are composers who were more traditional, less revolution, revolutionary, I would say. Uh, but if you look at the inventions uh, that somebody like Beethoven in his life, and of course he did not have the internet, and he did not have a lot of things that are for granted today for a composer, but for his time, what he achieved was a symphony, basically doubling the size of an orchestra, trying new instruments, you know, there was no uh, contrabassoon before in, in an orchestra. He added, you know, uh, trombones, exactly <laughs> trombones and, and, and percuss, percussion instrument, adding the voice to a symphony, you know, he started the yeah. art, the arms race, the size exactly. orchestra arms race. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, and, and there are other things also in the form, right? You know, Beethoven extended a form he inherited. And so if you look at the first one, the uh, first symphony versus the next symphony, or the first piano sonata towards the end of the string quartet and the last ones, huge development, huge, uh, and, and some of it has to do with technology as well. So my, my answer is that, yes, they would have liked to try, you know, if you ask me about Bruckner, probably not. You know, <laughs> it was our Brahm, love. Brahms, maybe not too. <laughs> right, right, right. But uh, yeah, the, the image that we have today of a composer is like something. Uh, you know, I think the image of audience who do not know much is like, oh, that's something kind of old and old-fashioned. Is very different than what it used to be. Absolutely, we're always changing and adapting to the times, and. Um, I see someone like Leonard Bernstein who who felt so comfortable like just crossing genre lines from concert music to, to Broadway musical theater to film score. Just interesting that you see composers making that journey, that journey. Absolutely. And and Leonard Bernstein is probably the name of one of the most complex, you know, artists in, in the last century. I mean, somebody that could was at home in Broadway and on the and on the concert uh, stage, you know, a few blocks up in New York <laughs> and around the world. And also as a, as a pianist, you know, playing um, classic and playing uh, jazz as a composer, as a conductor. I mean, absolutely the, the, the most versatile uh, artist. I have a question from the audience. Uh, someone from the Bay Area. This is Charles. He asks, if you could ask Beethoven one thing, what would it be? What, what do I ask Beethoven? Wow, that's a good question. You know, I could ask a lot of things. One thing I, I always is a kind of astound, like, why did he add the clarinets at the beginning of the Fifth Symphony? There's something like, you know, this string, ya da 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 and there are two clarinets in it, which you never hear. But if you take them out, something is, is and I'm, I wonder why Beethoven did not, like, it's a, such a statement, why didn't they put the entire orchestra there? Just string and clarinet. That's a really very musical uh, um, uh, question. If I would have asked more, it's like, why more not operas? <laughs> you know, it's only one opera. And uh, yeah, I, I certainly uh, adore it. Also conducted almost everything that Beethoven wrote for orchestra. So I'm kind of feel very... Including Wellington's off. Victory. Have you done that one? That's the one thing I did not do. <laughs> no one does that one. <laughs> <laughs> no one does that. <laughs> But from all symphonies, all concerti, and the opera, and the, the overtures, most of the overtures, but not this one. Um, yeah, I do, I do miss the, the Misa Solemnis, so that's a big oh. thing that this, yeah. One of the most challenging works and most, you know, I, every time I, I study, I study the Misa Solemnis, it's so complicated. I mean, it's just so above its time. I mean. And right. it, it must have been very puzzling to people when they heard it because it's got a little bit of everything and with the war music at the end and the, you know, the, the his free structure on form and his violin solo, the, the dove of set. It's just incredible, incredible music. Yeah. 
And Beethoven's one of those people we can, you know, he's one of those great artists we can spend a whole lifetime studying and performing and still think, like, hmm, why? I wonder why. He's so brilliant. Yes, and he, you know, there is something very obsessive in his music, this kind of stubbornness. I don't know, uh, you know, we say in the music, ostinato, it's the repetition of one thing. And that is if, you know, it's like um, a child around you, know, like, you know, come and asking the same thing and insisting on one thing. And as a composer, I mean, I don't know of anyone. I mean, today we are, we are used to, to hear and play minimal music, which essentially is the same. It's a repetition of one uh, pattern. But Beethoven did it 200 years before. And the, so there is this aspect. And then out of anything else, this comes this incredible, beautiful melody, very beautiful tune and simple. So this kind of, I won't say uh, polar kind of characters uh, just make him what, what he is, really a, a giant composer who um, not only relevant and beloved today, but music, the music world would not be the same without Beethoven. His, his influence. I would say if you today. take a look at the, like a, a still calm lake, he's that boulder thrown in the lake. Maybe him and Wagner, those boulders just tossed in there watching the waves go because, as a result. But exactly, Wagner would not be Wagner without Beethoven. And that's exactly the, the, what I'm talking about. There is a, a direct line. And there's some composer who did beautiful, wrote beautiful music. But, you know, if with them or without them, they did not really influence the course of history as, as Beethoven did. And so that's... Um, you know, I don't know. I would ask him why he never got married. You know, um, he had we, a romantic we know about, heart for but, the letters, right? It was such a, he had those, some of those letters are very romantic, very beautiful. Very romantic, very, yeah, very charming. He could be a very charming person. And we know a few, you know, ladies that he was interested in. And uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think we know what exactly happened, but... Um, yeah, you never the, let, the letters are always um, the letters are always uh, inexact because you know the tone changes based on who they're written to and who's <laughs> right. trying to appeal to. But it's very fascinating to read between the lines. I love reading scholars interpretation. I think I've read four or five of the big Beethoven books, and they each give you different insights. But the letters are very very helpful to read. And, and right, uh, well, you know, if to be, window. you're right, and, and to be quite realistic, to answer to Charles from the Bay Area, if we could have asked Beethoven, who is this immortal beloved? You know. <laughs> Could it could have one answer? You know, of course, the researchers came up with like three, four names uh, who could be those. But uh, just to know, Beethoven, who is this person you wrote to? Is, did it really exist, this person? Breaking uh, news. Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all want to know. It was a great movie, though. It was a great movie. Some good fiction in there, but a uh, great, great uh, film. I love exactly. that movie. So how about music of today? Where do you see the music of today going? Uh, I had We had um, Jan Swafford on the show, and we, he talked about composers today are like they're at the rubble of all the different composition schools, and they kind of pick and choose, and they put things together until they find a personal style. It's so different than it was, let's say, in Beethoven's time or because of those great composers who threw the boulders in the water. What are you seeing? I, we've had the minimalist school. We've had the atonal school and the serial school. Where do you see music going today? Well, Certainly, uh, you know, over the 20th century, um, there were a lot of attempts to shape the music in in different, uh, I would like to say, um, we, we are used to music as something beautiful. That's something, it's an entertainment. That's what, you know, when uh, Beethoven wrote and, and before that, he was writing for something, for the church, for the aristocrat families, for parties and things like that. So... Music, and that's part of the classic, has to be almost perfect, and you know all the lines has to be nice. There is no space for something that is ugly, or rough, or something like that. And over the 20th century, you know this changed a little bit. And composer says, "Well, it doesn't have to be always beautiful. It could be different. It could be, you know, um, something that doesn't make that's not logic. Maybe you put together sounds and com compress them, and that's also music." And I think, though, this experiment did not go too well with the 12-tone music, where he said it does not come, the primary, uh, you know, factor for that is a mathematic uh, formula. I don't have to repeat any of the tones before I do all 12 of them. 
you know, and, and with all uh, honesty, there are some beautiful moments also there by Alban Berg and Schoenberg, but the audience did not respond to that. The 12th turn music, you know, and, and of course, then the Darmstadt school and all of that, the avant-garde. I think today, um, most composer that I hear, um, I work with and or I listen to, uh, do want to be accessible do want the audience to understand them. And, and, and by understanding, I don't mean that they need to understand exactly the process or the technique and all of that. That's really left for musicians. But when you play something, you want the audience to come out from a performance as, I enjoyed it. I, li I, I witnessed something different. I can carry something with me that it enriched me. And so I think um, every composer n needs to find his or her own language and and the challenge is that to to be original and and i i i think this is the most difficult thing because you're right in the time of the baroque if you would listen to different composers you probably will not we will probably will not be able to distinguish one from another because they all wrote in the same style and today we are sort of asking every composer to come with his or her own different, distinguished style. This is a little bit unfair in a way. So I, I'm perfectly fine with some said that's maybe not the most original thing I've ever heard, but I'm happy with what I heard. I'm, I'm, I'm open to something new. And new does not have to be completely different. It could be you know, as Bram said, when they asked, when they told him, well, your symphony sounds like Beethoven, he says, well, even a donkey would know that. <laughs> you know, he was not ashamed to say, yeah, you know, I have such a huge uh, musical figure in my background. I honor that. I took it a step further. Uh, but yes, you could hear Beethoven in my music. So I don't think it's a problem if a composer today writes something and say, well, you know, it does sound a little bit like Ravel or like Prokofiev. I think it's perfectly fine. Um, so yes, it's, it is tough, uh, to find your own language, but when it is, uh, happening and, and when you, you hear something that I can connect to that. And for me, the one most important thing is that, you know, we play for people. It's not, I, when I choose a piece, it's not, I'm trying to satisfy my own taste. Uh, I, I really try to think of the people who come to the concert. Would they have fun hearing it? Would they be enjoyed? And and maybe fun is not the right thing. Maybe, will, will they be enriched? Music could be a sad one. It's a tragic event that caused that. I don't expect people to laugh at that. But would they get out of the concert with something interesting, something new that lifted them up from the, the rest of the day? So that's that's one of the parameters. Thank you for sharing that. What's it like when you discover a new composer? I mean, you got, must go through so many scores as in your many different associations. What's it like when you discover something new and exciting? It's beautiful. And um, I make sure that I do, you know, at least four or five world premieres every year. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a lot of them, you know, are people that I've heard of or I played a piece. Uh, I just recorded a, uh, a CD in Italy um, a month ago, it was a composer that I first uh, premiered his music here in the U.S. and we became friends, Christian Carrara. And um, then I played his piece in Florida, and then I played his piece uh, in Italy with the Toscanini Philharmonic. And this is now a piece that we did uh, in the north, in the, um, the north of Italy, with a wonderful orchestra, the Friuli Veneto Giulia Symphony, and was entire album of his music hmm. and you know it's 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 beautiful to know that some of the pieces i initiated sort of the process he also wrote a piece for my orchestra in israel um a song cycle fantastically written and jonathan leshnoff an american composer with whom i worked before his, and um, his his, mo his mother teaches at seton hall with me that's right. Yeah, I, I, I knew that she's a teacher, right? And Jonathan is an incredible composer. And I uh, perform maybe five or six of his pieces. And uh, it's never enough. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's tricky. And, uh, you know, there was a time. So one of the pieces we actually co-commissioned with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And uh, I went to see the premiere in uh, the Kimmel Center 
with the Philadelphia Orchestra, Yannick, Maestro Yannick Nezek Segan, who is fantastic. Uh, and it's a clarinet concerto. And I, and I said, well, I have such a first class clarinet here in Santa Barbara. I would love him to play this piece. So we co collaborated, and that was Don Foster, our own uh, clarinetist, did such a phenomenal job. And um, yeah, so I have, you know, th these are composers that I every sec you know, second season maybe will perform their music. I'm doing uh, one of Christian Carrara piece I'm actually recording in London in March. That's a piano concerto with the London Phil. So I've done his pieces now with maybe five or six orchestras. And um, again, it's always a pleasure to do a Jennifer Higdon, a Christopher Rouse piece. Um, you know, I, I, there are a lot of fantastic composers. Of course, in Israel, I'm trying to do more of the Israeli composers. Uh, you know, I think it's important that the orchestra is, you know, giving the stage to to composer from its own country. It's very difficult to get. Very uh, powerful. You know, Who are some know, of the names we should know that we may not know here in the States? Right. So, for, for example, one of the composers I've done recently, uh, what for me is Odette Zahavi, uh, fantastic composer. Uh, composer Ella Sharif, uh, female uh, composer, fantastic. And also his personal relationship, I know. Uh, I, I've studied with her husband uh, conducting. And uh, Noam Sharif is not only was a, a fantastic conductor, but an incredible composer. Leonard Bernstein premiered his own piece when Noam was 18 years old. And I brought the music of Noam to both here, Santa Barbara in Florida, they loved it. And, um, and the, I mean, the musicians, and that's for me, you know, that's the first kind of challenge when you have the orchestra, you bring a piece maybe from your country or from somewhere. And uh, that's one of the things I'm always a little bit nervous, like how the musicians will react, because that's the first one you work with. The audience is, comes after. And if the musicians are not happy with the piece, you know, so, I, did, I didn't do great, but with the music, um, both of uh, Noam and or last now for Krista, the musicians were very happy. And and I think if a musician is happy with a new piece, and they are, by the way, they play much more contemporary music than us because they are so a part of many other groups. And and they do the studios, you know, certainly the musicians uh, here. Um, so for them, they, they, I think they have developed skills to know what is a good piece in the sense that how is it well orchestrated is the form is is good and and so to see their reaction is for me the first uh parameter to say yes that's right and and sometimes it was not so you know we learned <laughs> well not, as we know from history not all of the great composers some of their symphonies didn't hit as well as other ones or maybe they needed revisions some of the verdi opera certainly were massively revised and uh you know, sometimes exactly. it doesn't happen the first time. Exactly. And, you know, there are some very famous composers on in their times that today nobody will perform. Uh, that's uh, our taste change, I guess. Um, or, you know, the, ch the taste of the period in, in France where Meyerbeer did his gigantic operas. Uh, today, it's not a name that most people would recognize. But in those times, in Paris, that was like the number one. You know, Wagner left Paris very angry and frustrated because of that. So maybe it was good then Wagner could write his thing because, you know, it's... Are there any pieces in the repertoire that you're still, you're looking forward to conduct that you haven't approached yet? I, I never conducted uh, the music of uh, Florence Price. Hmm. And so I've heard a lot of Florence Price this year. It's really made right, a comeback exactly. this year. Okay. Yeah. And that's part of, you know, part of why we discovered is Well, I had a name somehow, but um, I never heard, I never had a chance to study score. And it's beautiful. It's very, it's very romantic. Talking about that's, that's not a very avant-garde piece. And it was written in the 30s or so. So I'm so looking forward to that because it's really beautiful music and greatly orchestrated. And that's in my May. Um, I'm also happy because um, we combined it with uh, the piano concerto in F by Gershwin, but it's played uh, with a jazz trio combo. So um, instead of the piano part, the piano part will be featured or divided with a uh, trio combo. And that's really um, uh, Marcus Roberts, uh, jazz trio, a phenomenal musician who played a lot with uh, Winton Marsalis. 
Mm. Uh, and he brings his own uh, jazz combo, uh, bass and percussion, which is also, uh, the, the percussionist is also the one of the Marsalis family, Antonio. And so, and this is quite a cool version. Well, the orchestra plays the Gershwin version and uh, the piano part is extended and do some improvisation. And uh, so that's, I, I think that is pretty much in the spirit of- uh, Gershwin would have loved would, it, absolutely. Would have loved it, exactly. Um, I'm, doing in, I'm doing in Israel um, a piece, a piano, a violin concerto that written by really a fantastic composer, Israeli, lives in the new, in, the, in America, I think in the Cleveland area. His name is Avner Dorman. Oh, yeah. he's had a huge, yeah, I've heard nothing but great things. I've never, right. I don't know so much you, about his music. I have to look that up. His, his music is great, and he, uh, we bring a, a violin concerto wrote, premiered by uh, Lara St. John's, and um, that's uh, that's really a project I'm very happy to bring to Israel. It, it was actually, he got a prize in Canada, and it's a collaboration with them. And again, it's another uh, way to connect with other parts of the world. That's, I think that's the future for certainly for smaller organization, you know, to produce something on it on your own is difficult. Uh, you need a lot of resources and things like that. But if you can connect and work with other uh, organizations, then you are better off to make it happen. That collaboration is so important. And uh, music is one of the ways, you know, there's so many things that divide us in culture and society. Music is one of the ways we can connect cultures and connect societies and cross national boundaries and ideological divides. Right. Which reminds me, you know, I, I found a fantastic trumpet player on our online French from a Lebanese uh, region. So, you know, I, I just reached out and we'll see what happens and say, well, we should collaborate. You know, I have some Lebanese regions and uh, <laughs> yes, if we if we if if we can collaborate musicians with no, you know, uh, boundaries, with no borders that uh, that. That would be huge. Well, thank you so much and continued success in all of your uh, interesting programming and putting together great programs and working with great composers, new and old. Uh, it's great to have you back on the show. Uh, so what's your next performance going to be and when is it going to be and where can people find out more about you and your work? So next performance is in Santa Barbara. That will be on the 19th, I think, on 20th of fe uh, February uh, that weekend. And that's what I said about Jeff Beal. We also have coming up Cameron Carpenter in March, Oregon Star, and I'm also delighted that's in March, as I told about uh, Marcus Roberts, and also in April, um, a world premiere of a piece by Schumann, orchestrated for two pianos, or adapted for two pianos by Brahms, and reorchestrated now by Austrian composer Richard Tunzer, and that will be the premiere of that, and that's uh, based on the quartet Opus 47 by Schumann, but a totally new touch with uh, two friends, Gil and uh, Gabor and Sivan Gabor, they have a fantastic piano duo. So that's in April um, here, and I do the uh, same thing with, uh, with them in Israel, not the same piece, but with Sivan and Gil, we do uh, the Brahms Quintet, uh, which he also first wrote or a queen that then uh, piano four hands and then an orchestration for a, a string orchestra. So there are plenty of programs and uh, thank you, Jason, for having me in your show. Pleasure. Keep a pleasure on innovating. To talk to you. Make sure everyone checks out uh, Maestro Cabaretti's work and go on his website and say, see him live when he's in your town. So thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Music Matters with Jason Tran. Please remember to subscribe to us on YouTube and smash that bell icon. Follow us on our social media outlets and remember, keep music alive.